plus and then continued on. And now she's at KCA College and I hope you're settling in well. But, but they've just been a blessing uh, as a ministry for worship together with the rest of the team. So thank you very much. Today I, I, I did the half of the service online, though I was in the office trying to follow the worship from uh, the computer just listening in. And it was nice just to listen in and to have an experience of being somehow on virtual, but I know I'm in the compound, but it was wonderful. But it's good to see all of you, a uh, wonderful morning this day. We praise God that we continue to see his goodness and his mercy. I want to trust that uh, even the fasting and prayer is catching up well, and it's, it's, it's doing you well, even as you take time to commune before the presence of the Lord. And this is something that we trust that God will allow us on various occasions just to take time to pray, to fast, because these are the disciplines that ground us. These are the disciplines that help us to encounter God even in a more powerful way. And, and just on that note, we, we want to set a, a, a day of praying, uh, kind of like an I praise meeting every second Friday of the month. We will begin next month uh, because this, this, this one has already passed. So on the, is it the 9th of February, which will be the second Friday, uh, we will have from 6 p.m. Uh, I praise. I praise is basically a time to pray, but it is mixed with praise and worship. And so we have a worship experience that is also together simultaneously a time of prayer. And so those that come will get to worship God, which is part of prayer, and also pray over different things, personal, uh, church, and many other ways. And so that will become a monthly place of prayer. We used to pray Saturday morning, sometimes back, but I feel if we just put it on Friday evening for those who are able to make it, it will be between 6 and 8 p.m. so that uh, people can still get back home uh, because of the curfew and the timings that we have. We can't yet do cashers at the moment, but when God will allow us to pass this phase and down the road when we no longer have some of these restrictions, it will be good once in a while to come to the house of the Lord and Kesha, isn't it? When we say Keshas have been abolished and, 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 and we no longer do them and we should find ways once in a while to do that. But for now, we will stick with the high praise that happens. So mark your calendars on that particular day when we will be having the high praise and we welcome all of you for the service. The reminders will keep coming through the various platforms. Well, we want to continue with our summon series for today. And for those who this might be the first time that they are joining us, I'll do a very brief recap for us of what the series has been about before we jump into today's particular message. We are talking about grit, and when we began this series, one of the definitions that I gave towards the word grit was that it's a willingness to conquer challenges instead of avoiding them. That it's both a trait and a skill, a combination of having passion and perseverance and a very strong belief that failure can be overcome. And in a sense, this has set like the theme for us in this year 2021, where we are looking at the year as a time when our resolution is that we are not going to succumb to whichever challenges that we know are not only present, but will also come. We may not even know others that are on their way. But what we understand as a people of God is that when challenges that are inevitable come into our life, there is someone whose grace and strength allows us to overcome. And that's why our theme for the year is our resolution to overcome and not to succumb. And so I pray that that will be true in, our, in your life and in the life of every member of this church. And when we began the series, I gave the four qualities that we are going to tackle over the course of the month concerning godly grit. Because we talked about the grace of God in the other Sunday, how it is important as a very basic foundation of you having grit, having that ability to continue uh, with your passion and, 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 and your goals and your pursuits and overcoming challenges as they come. Some of it is by the grace of God and not by our own strength. We talked about resilience last Sunday and, and we shared about how it is also one of those qualities that is very important. Today we'll have the opportunity to talk about innovation, and then next Sunday we'll talk about time, because time is allotted by God, and all of us are supposed to utilize it and redeem it carefully. And so when we look at inno innovation today, this is something we often associate with, um, okay, let me ask this. When you, talk of, when you think of innovation, creativity, mention some organizations that come to your mind. Mm -hmm. Google, uh -huh. somebody else, Safaricom, somebody else, Apple, somebody else. So far, no church has been mentioned. 
and I can't blame you for not mentioning a church or a religious organization because the truth of the matter has been that somehow innovation is not in, in many respects considered like part of the faith conversations. And that is very unfortunate. The church has been found to be the one that is very less imaginative when it comes to trying innovation or adapting even into the new things that come. And there's always been this tension, especially between the Christian, uh, not only Christian, but I think most religions, uh, the tension between advancements in society and new technologies coming and things that are invented and looking at them as probably all technology is evil and we need to avoid them at all costs. Some of these things when they were invented, Christians were the last ones to try and adopt them. They were looking at them hesitancy. You know, it is the time of Akina, Billy Graham and such, who started using things like this speaker that you see here. Before that, a lot of the men of God had refused this, these gadgets. They had said, this, this thing is, 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 is taking the gospel and, and trying to project it in the air. And we know that the Bible says that the, the devil is the prince of the air. And he, this thing is not actually good. But later on, we came to adapt to it. And even up to today, we have that tension. A story is said about uh, a place where flooding came. There was a lot of rain, and so flood began. And a particular man of God decided to go up the roof of his house because now the water was slowly climbing on, on, on the house. And while he's on top of the roof, he shouts for help, but he begins to pray. He trusts that God will provide a miracle, and he will be rescued so that he doesn't drown from the flood. And so there's somebody with a boat who passes by and tells him, please come into the boat so that we are able to escape. And he tells him, no, 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 me, I'm praying. God is sending something. God is sending an angel to me. And so the boat goes. And then another speedboat now comes. Now speedboats are those ones that are more faster because the waters have continued to rise now. And so the person on the speedboat tells him, please jump over and then I can get you out of this particular flood. And the guy still says, no, I am steadfastly praying and waiting on the Lord here. I know he will send me an angel. And then when the waters are now quite higher, Finally, a helicopter shows up, and the person in the helicopter speaks loudly from a loudspeaker and tells him, we are throwing you a rope, and when we throw you the rope, catch it so that we can pull you over, and then we can get you out of here. And he still says no. Eventually, this wonderful Christian is washed away by the flood, and he drowns. And obviously, as a good Christian, after his death, he's in heaven, and when he goes straight to the throne of God, complaining and asking, how come I prayed and you did not intervene? You did not come. God is puzzled and wonders, what else did you want me to send you? There were two boats and there was a helicopter. So the guy realized, quite well, those things can also be used by Christians to save us in times of trouble. And you see, that tension between technology, advancement, innovations, and sometimes people of faith. Yet when we look at the Bible, our God is the most innovative person. Innovation basically, in a simple definition, is defined as a means to improve or to replace something. Often, this is done with the aim of improving efficiency, effectiveness, or having a competitive advantage. It can be something that is already in place and all you do is retweak it and improve it, or it can be developing a whole new product altogether, and companies are known for this. So in practical terms, it is manifested most of the time when people do new things, they bring new ideas, they new, there are new methods of doing things, devices are developed uh, to, 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 to do several things that were done in a more difficult way before. And so the God that we serve is one of the most innovative people. And that is the reason why it should be actually very ironic that those that are children of God, those that, that belong to the house of the Lord, should be the people who actually lead in the spheres of innovation. Because our God is not only a creator, he's an innovator. And, and, and just right from the beginning of the Bible, we see the powers of creation and innovation in the God that created us. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 to 2, look at the way the earth is described here. It says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form, and it was void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Other versions will talk about the earth was in chaos. It was in a state that no, it was not habitable. Nobody could live in such a state. 
everything was mumbled up. What does God do? His act of creation is done in a very innovative way because he begins, the very first word that actually follows in verse 3 of Genesis chapter 1 is that God will say, let there be light. Because we've just read there that the earth was in darkness, isn't it? You can't work in darkness. So he starts in a pattern and in a systematic way to begin to organize the chaos into something that we have now, this very beautiful planet earth that we have. What we see, and sometimes they say, the other book that God has written besides the scriptures is the creation itself. Just looking at the organization of how the world has been formed, it talks of an innovator, it talks of a creator. And even in many more cases throughout the scriptures, we may not even have the opportunity to list them in one sermon such as this one, but scripture is full of God gradually innovating and doing new things and, and improving on some of the things that he had done before. You remember, like, for example, if you think of this, from the very beginning, the communication means through which God operates in Genesis, mostly with Abraham and the initial people, is very oral. His word is transmitted by those that he has appointed to speak and go share it with others. And this happens for a while. The prophets of the servants of God are talked about orally, but oral is not sustainable. The accuracy of information and the message will be contaminated in between. If even we take an experiment and I speak something to Pastor Sam here, and he shares it with, he, it goes in turns. By the time it comes back to me, it will be a different message altogether. That's the unreliability of oral communication. So what does God do? God begins by to, to, to write his words so that they are, one of all, they are preserved and then they are accurate. People are able to make a reference to the word and say, this is what God intended. This is what God said. So it's not a hearsay. It's not just an oral means of communicating to people. And the first occasion we see that, is when he tells Moses to create the commandments in a tablet of stones. You know, some of you think tablet was formed by Akina Apple. Tablet zilianza kitambo. Eh? Akina Veneza. Mnyu mnajua mnafikia tablet is a squeeze. Moses ndi alianzisha ikitu. Aliangua na big man bazu. Mwenyewe. Sibo ndo mna mutaka. That write on the tablets. And so tablets are already there. And God began to innovate ways in which his word can be preserved. Today, we have his word in writing, and it is preserved. Even after the fall, one of the occasions when God decides to wipe out and begin afresh is in the story of Noah and the technology that goes into building the ark. You see, Noah was the first designated survivor. It's not this program we see. He was the first designated survivor because God spared him and said, I want continuity of life through this family. And so he brings Noah into the ark and gives him the innovation to build such an, a, a thing that was able to contain all this life that then perpetuated humanity even after that particular time. I think about Jacob and when he was working for his uncle Laban. And this man has been working for 20 years. And he's, he wants to be paid good wages, but he puts an idea to his uncle and says, let's agree that there are certain breeds of flock that if they give birth to a certain breed, they're mine, the other breed is yours. So his uncle decides to take the particular breed that he knows might reproduce what Jacob is going to earn and hides them away. <laughs> But what does Jacob do? The guy does something very funny in Genesis chapter 30 that almost borders on a kamote kind of idea. And then he mixes some things there that the animals, when they breed, they actually produce a new breed. He became innovative, and he became richer than even his uncle Laban. Jesus himself will talk about we are not supposed to put new wineskins into the old wineskins. You actually need to create new wine skins when you have new wine. And he was talking especially to people who were still stuck with the methods that God had used in the past. And they wanted those methods to still continue. Yet Jesus was trying to tell them, God is a God who moves. And when he moves and brings a new set of way of operating, you need to adjust to that particular way. But some are always stuck in the past. And this has been the story. Especially after the early church, much of Christendom in this other modern dispensation has always found itself lagging behind 
and very suspicious. And there's a place to be skeptical about some of the technology. The problem is technological advancements and many innovations mostly begin as innocent things that are tools, tools that can be used for good or bad, but in and of themselves, they don't carry morality. They are innocent. And so it's the place where Christians are actually supposed to be the ones spearheading this thing, but yet we become the one that fear it so much. And so I, there are many stories in the Bible that I could have chosen from. I was spoiled for choice of where we can draw a narrative about the spirit of innovation. But I found just the right story because this story is familiar with almost all of us and it's a wonderful story. This is the story of David and Goliath, which every Sunday school child has been told. Most of us have read it over and over again. It is found in First Samuel. If we turn our Bibles there, hopefully time will allow us to read because reading it all in its entirety is how you get to capture the story. But most of you have read it before, so if, if we skip some parts, that's still fine. In Genesis, sorry, in 1 Samuel chapter 17, the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle where were gathered as uh, Soko, which belongs to Judah. They encamped between Soko and Azekah and Ephes and Damin and Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and they encamped in the valley of Elam and drew up in battle array against Philistines. The Philistines stood on a mountain on one side and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side with the valley between them. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head and he was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze and he had a bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels, and a shield bearer went before him. Then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man from among yourselves and let him come down to me. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and servants. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now David was the son uh, was the son of that Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, and who had eight sons. And the man was old, advanced in years in the days of Saul. The three oldest sons of Jesse had gone to follow Saul to the battle. The names of three sons who went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, next to him was Abinadab, and the third, Shama. David was the youngest, and the three oldest followed Saul. But David occasionally went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at, the Beth at Bethlehem. And the Philistine drew near and presented himself 40 days, morning and evening. Then Jesse said to his son David, take now, your brother, take now for your brothers an ephah of this dried grain and these ten loaves and run to your brothers at the camp and carry these ten cheeses of captain of the, of the thousands and see how your brothers are faring and bring back news of them. Now Saul and, uh, now Saul and they all of the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. So David rose early in the morning, left the ship with the keeper and took the things and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the camp as the army was going out to the fight and shouting for battle for Israel and the Philistines had drawn up battle array army against army. And David left his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper, ran to the army and came and greeted his brothers. Then as he talked with them, there was the, ch there was the champion, the Philistine of God, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines. And he spoke according to the same words. So David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, they fled from him and were dreadful, dreadfully afraid. So the men of Israel said, have you seen this man? who has come up, surely he has come up to defy Israel. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches, will give him his daughter and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. Then David spoke to the men who stood by him saying, what shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philippine, Philistine that he should, he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in this manner saying, so shall it be done for a man who kills him. Now Eliab, his elder brother, skip that part, his brothers are not happy about this situation and so they try to discourage David. Okay? Now we to verse 31. Now when the words David spoke were heard, 
they reported them to Saul, and he said, he sent for him. Then David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail. Because of him, your servant will go and fight with the Philistine. And Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. You are a youth, and he is a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went after it and struck it and delivered the, la the, the lamb from its mouth. And it when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And, said, and, they, and, and, and Saul said, to David, go and the Lord be with you. Definitely, they don't even believe that this, this uh, David will accomplish anything. So Saul clothed David with his armor and put a bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with this, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. Then he took his staff in his hands, and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, in a pouch which he had, and his sling was in his hand. And so then David will come and approach Goliath. Okay, then Goliath will, will say those words, feeling like this is... This is a dog, I mean, you're coming to me with sticks, verse 45. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of the hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you to my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you, and this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistine to the birds of the air. Okay? Then... Verse 48, so it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Then David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone, and he slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead, so that the stone sank into his, in, into his forehead, and he fell on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, and struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in, his, in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword, drew it out of its sheath, and killed him and cut off his head. And this obviously gave motivation to the rest of the army. Now they join in to go pursue the Philistines because they've seen that the giant has been slain. When Saul saw David go against verse 55, the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, as your, as your soul lives, O king, I do not know. So the king said, inquire whose son this young man is. Then as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with, his, with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, whose son are you, young man? So David answered, I am the son of your servant Jesse, the Bethlehemite. What a story. And this is an encounter not only between David and Goliath, though that always takes the main center stage when we narrate it, but it's also an encounter between two nations. The Philistines and the Israelites are in a battle, and they are in this valley of Elah, and just to give context why they had to choose someone from each camp. Whenever they battled and they found themselves in a valley, what they would do is as one army would remain on one side of the mountain, another one on the other side. And because the valley's terrain is such that you can't come in with chariots and horses and then begin hand-to-hand -hand combat, it's easy to select one representative and, and, and bring him from your end, and you guys also bring one representative. And whoever wins from the two is actually a representation of their side of the army having won. And so the stakes are high. And this is very important. But there is another context that sometimes we forget when we read this story, which is very important in light of what we are sharing today. If you go back to 1 Samuel chapter 13, to read from verse 19 to 22 there, okay, this is what the reality was about the Israel army. Not a blacksmith, 1 Samuel chapter 13 from verse 19, not a blacksmith could be found in the whole land of Israel. Because the Philistines had said, otherwise the Hebrews will make swords or spears. So all Israel went down to the Philistines to have their plowshares, their mattocks, their axes, and their sickles to be sharpened. 
The price was two thirds of a shekel for sharpening plowshares and mattocks, and the third of a shekel for sharpening the fox and axes and for repointing the gods. So on the day of the battle, not a soldier with Saul and Jonathan had a sword or a spear in his hand. Only Saul and his son Jonathan the prince had them. Now, this context I'm giving it because many times people fail to recognize that by this time when this battle is taking place, the army of Israel, in as far as machinery and equipment for warfare is concerned, they are quite depleted. They do not have the same ammunition. They do not have the same sophisticated modern swords that the Philistines had. Because the Philistines were actually dominating them that time, they refused to actually allow Israelites to own swords. And even when you wanted to sharpen like your plow, things that you use for agriculture, they would charge you exorbitantly, the prices that you are seeing mentioned there. And so Israelites would only prioritize when they need to sharpen their, their axes and the things they need for their farm tools and for their sustenance. But as far as spears, javelin, and other equipment, they didn't have. So actually the only spear and javelin that was available was the one that Saul had because he was the king, and then his son Jonathan, who was the prince, were the only ones in the army who had some armor that was actually more sophisticated. So this is a battle between an army that is one already afraid because they are the one of the people on the other side is a giant, but on top of that, they know they have less weaponry. But they are facing an army that is more equipped. And so for the Israelites to be able to actually fight and win the battle against the Philistines. They will need to innovate. They will need to be creative around how they go about it. They have less tools. They have, don't have the same amount of, 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 of weapons that, that these other guys have. And also, they don't have a giant, okay? So everything, the stacks are, I mean, the odds are against them. And that's why they're hesitant. And no one is willing to step up and fight with Goliath. And so that's why when David comes into the scene, it actually demonstrates why the decision by David shows how this was a man who carries the traits and characteristics of how innovators are. You know, they say innovators are people who, they are action-oriented. That's one of the traits they have, isn't it? Innovators are people who are opportunity-focused. And you can see, David keeps asking, who, what's the going to like pay? Who, what will be given to the man? He, he's already concluded he will kill the man. He will kill the giant. So I just want to know what are my wages. Him is already seeing the opportunity. He, was a, he had a mental resilience. He had courage. And he was also not hesitant re about the uncertainties that were there. And so he steps up. He's not even part of the army. By coincidence, when he's bringing food to his elder brothers in the battlefield, Goliath has come in his usual way for the past 40 days. He has been coming and demanding a challenge from the side of Israel, and nobody's offering him a challenge. Saul himself, who actually has one of the armors, is not himself offering a challenge. What Saul is offering instead is, quote unquote, a bribe to any soldier who actually defends the nation. I'll give you my daughter, I'll not, you'll not pay taxes, I will also give your family wealth and so he's trying all ways that a leader can to entice at least one of the soldiers here to step up on our behalf but none has taken the offer and so this young teenager David is a teenager at this point comes in and says well this guy cannot come here every other day and you guys are doing nothing I, I mean I want to fight the man and you can see his brothers are very angry at him because they already see their brother will die. They tell him, stop being so proud. You are a youth. When he goes to Saul, the same story, you are a youth, you cannot fight this particular man. And by all measurements, it looked like if David was to take up the challenge, which he eventually did, he would be the underdog. But there's a problem of how we've always narrated this story and how we've always perceived this story. We've never perceived it from the eyes of God. We've always perceived this story from the eyes of man. And that's why the celebration around this story has always been that the underdog David was able to defeat a giant. And what a marvelous thing. But think of it. Was David really the underdog? The assumption is that because he's facing a giant, David is the underdog. 
people assume he's, he's, he's a young person, he's inexperienced, he has not been a soldier, his body size, and all those kinds of things. But if I would ask, was God seeing David in the same way? Was God looking at the things that we are looking? Was it God looking and figuring out, Goliath is in trouble. David is not the one in trouble. And this is because for all of us, it is common human nature to look at the person who has some of these traits that are considered minor as the one who will actually be defeated. But David does several things that actually disapprove this notion. Number one of what makes David a lesson for embracing a spirit of innovation is the first thing he does. David disproves the idea that the giant always win. The giant doesn't always win. But we read this story with the assumption that the giant will win and we all come out surprised that the, the small guy is the one who has, a, has actually won. You see, the reason why David is actually the person with the upper hand, if you look at it, is that Goliath is coming into this battle ready to apply all the conventional methods of fighting, looking at his advantages as he's a big man and all those kinds of things, he has better equipment, but David is coming with an innovative mind. When faced between a person who's relying on his traditional skills and a person who has an innovative mind, the guy who is innovative stands the better chance. We just never see it that way. Because everybody assumes the giant is too big to fail. The big company is too big to fall. And so the narrative goes that they will, the ones who will dominate the market, they are the ones who will always thrive, they are the ones who will always go into the new ventures. But history is full of Davids, in as far as maybe companies or individuals are concerned, that actually disproved the same thing that David did, that the giant is not always the favorite. The giant can lose, and they do lose. They talk about Kodak, and many people talk about this in the, in the, in the corporate world, isn't it? That they were giants in, 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 in picture and print media, and nobody imagined their failure. And in 2012, when they finally folded, it was just at a time when in the boardroom they were fighting between the print division and the digital division of the company. Because the digital division, which was under resource, was saying, we are the future, invest in us. The print is not going to be the future. The future is digital. But because they were a print company all these years of pictures, they decided to go with the traditional, the ones they know, what they've always seen winning. So they assumed, like everybody assumes, that this is going to be the trend. They didn't realize that change comes. And they created a website which they wanted to put pictures and people to print from there. But the digital guys were like, no, we should just create something where people can share pictures. Before long, Instagram came and said, you don't need to print pictures, you can just share pictures, isn't it? And they are there, Kodak is gone. A giant fell. Every bank could not even allow us to open accounts when we were, I don't know that you know, as hustlers or the poor, okay? Until Equity said, Kwani, Mamamboga is not worthy of an account. A small person came, the stanchers, the other guys were there. But is it equity a giant equally with them now? The small guy with an innovative mind is more little, and you need to watch against him because people always assume, and the problem is the giants will always sit in their laurels and assume that they will never be conquered. And that is the mindset I feel Goliath has come with. That is why in God's eyes, and the reality is the person who's more lethal in this fight is David. He's not coming with assumptions. He's coming with the ability of saying, I know I am at a disadvantage, but I know that I can apply the experience and some of the things that I've done in the past that are not conventional fighting ways, but they can work against this giant. And that's what he ended up doing, and he ended up conquering. You see, the small ones are always despised. I remember in childhood, part of our culture was fights. For no reason. Especially estate versus, versus estate. So me and a few, one of my good friends was called Chalo because we were all small bodies. So we were always the ones who, 
most of the time approach the fight with a lot of terrified hearts because the assumption is always the big guys will win the battle. So one time, one of those fights has been put, Chalo has been thrown into the mix, and he's facing this tall guy. Chalo is a tiny guy, just like I was. I was actually very short back then. And so we, 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 are, we are waiting to see. Everybody has assumed Chalo will be beaten. The guy anashtua ivi Chalo anakimbia nyuma. Because Chalo is not going to, 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 to just bring himself to this guy and beat him. He needs timing. He keeps looking. The moment the guy just slipped in attention Kidogo, Chalo was on top of him. And before long, we are pulling Chalo out of this guy, telling him, don't kill this man, don't kill this man. <laughs> the small guy is the one being removed to, be res to rescue the, the big guy. Because the assumption is always, this guy will beat him. Nobody ever thinks that what about the small guy? Doesn't he have certain techniques that he can bring into this particular situation and actually win this battle? In as much as the human eyes, the odds look like the giant will be the one. Because when everybody is looking at Goliath and seeing such a big person that you can't beat him, David is actually saying, I can't miss. He's too big a target. When you're given a narrow target, you're likely to miss. When I'm given a whole like a giant of a thing, I will definitely hit. And so I will approach it. You see, you can go to the gym and, and, and do your muscles and, and, and prepare for a fight with me all you can. And me, who maybe has a small body, I will go and practice my shooting range. And so you come with your muscles, I'll just put my, I'll pull out my .5 caliber and aim at you. Innovation has won over muscles. Innovation will always win. So everybody assumed the muscles will win. No. The people that think outside the box are likely to win in most of the occasions. Secondly, we see David deploying non-traditional tactics. Not only does he disprove the notion or the idea that the giant is always the one that will win, he also brings what innovators always bring when they come into a scene, non-traditional tactics, ways that have not been thought of before. They are not necessarily just following the guidelines of warfare, the way they've been followed. He, Saul gives David his own armor. David puts on the armor of Saul, and immediately he tells Saul, I cannot wear this. What does he do? He returns it to Saul. Because everybody is assuming if you are to stand a chance against the giant, at least use some of these weapons we always use as soldiers. But David is saying no. And, and he explains to Saul his reason for why he's not going to take the armor. As good as it is, first of all, it's too big. Saul is this big guy as well. So David is going to fight and he's going to be there trying to hold a, a sword of the king which is big and wear these heavy things on him. How will he even be agile and flexible? Which are his strengths? His strength as a small bodied guy is that he's agile, he's swift, he can run, he can jump, he can evade Goliath. Those are the strengths he has. So if he does not allow those to operate, he will be defeated. And so he, de he refuses the armor and what he chooses to do is to take what he has used. Even at the place of obscurity when he faced a bear and a lion. He takes his stone and his sling. And again, the mistake that people make is to underestimate some of the non-conventional technologies that innovators bring. We allow them until we see their impact. <laughs> okay? You start saying, ah, what, have they, what have they invented? Ah, women are here, kito ita enda mahali, haita enda mahali. And then you start realizing it is catching up. It is catching up. Before long, it has taken over. You see, who says that the sling and the stone is not a powerful weapon? That's the human assumption. But do you know a sling is very dangerous? If, if somebody, eh, they say, Rujre, Zungusha is that thing, and releases a rock on it, it comes like a bullet. Rocks kill people. It's only that because everybody dies with a sword in most of the time, you assume the sword is better than the sling. And that's a problem with people who don't innovate. They go with the only true tested things always. They never assume that, what about this guy? He has come with an interesting tool. Might it do the same job? And innovators do that. 
They bring a new thing that may not look as conventional as the one that is existing in the market, but when they apply it, it brings the same result. It is cheap. It does not require so much resources to build. These Philistines were denying Israelites to sharpen their swords. They were denying them armory so that they can have an advantage of fighting. But would they deny them rocks? Can they say Israelites cannot own rocks, they cannot own stones? Because they never imagined a stone as a weapon. So they secured themselves by making sure our enemies don't have the sophisticated weapons. But they forgot that one of these young men anointed of God will actually not come in the same way. He will not look for a sword. In fact, when he's offered a sword, he gives it up. He will just look for a smooth five of them. And he only used one. And get to me and he puts it in his pouch and he comes. He has been aiming for a long time. People assume that David does not know how. David has been using this thing while he's guarding his flock for his father. And when the bear comes or the lion or any wolf, he just does this and scares them away. But if they happen to actually take, he goes and now wrestles with them. That's what he testified to Saul about. And that's the assumption. Who says, just because the javelin has been seen in action for so long and the stone has not been seen in action, that the javelin will always have the day. There is a day that the stone will disapprove the javelin, and it happened on that particular time. Non-traditional tactics. I wish the Philistines had remembered their history. Because, you know, these guys were always in a match. Rematch, match versus match. If you go back to the book of Judges, the Philistines are fighting with... Israelites again. But this time, the Philistines were the underdogs. But they also became innovative, but their innovation was very cruel to the Israelites. Do you know how they innovated? That time, Israelites are the ones who had a version of a giant. They had a man called Samson, if you know Samson. You know, Samson. Blessed by God with sheer strength, muscle. This was a man who took the jaw of an, a, a donkey and beats 1,000 people and defeats them and kills them. The Philistines cannot match him. They try to trap him. When they come, he just needs to come up and fight, and nobody can actually withstand the strength of, of Samson. It has been given by God himself. So the Israelites did not have ways. Sorry, the Philistines. But what happened? They reached a point of Kachoka. They unleashed a weapon called Delilah. An unconventional weapon <laughs> upon the Israelites. They just said, let's... One of the things we have seen in Samson from our intelligence reports, you know those intelligence reports we receive, is that this man is a womanizer. This man, I mean, he's a mighty man, but one area that we know he likes is women. So let's take one of our most beautiful ladies and they send Delilah to Samson. And Delilah just does what he does. Delilah does not use a sword, does not do anything to even harm Samson. In fact, he possesses the man. <laughs> the man is put to sleep and a makasi is taken and all the strength that of Mawua watu wetu sana kwisha kwenye kabisa the war is won Samson wakes up there is no strength anymore this can win every time more than this that's what innovation is about see kifua tu kifua kifua you have a mind created by God. Be innovative. That is when you actually have the edge. And so in this case, the tables are turned, and the Philistines had gone back to think in terms of, since we have denied them weapons, we will win. But they failed to account for a young man called David, who actually had a lethal weapon as well, in as much as nobody gave it credit until they saw Goliath down and dead. For thirdly, David plays to his strength. That's the other thing that he does. We've already explained a lot of this. Because the time frame that David had to prepare to fight Goliath was immediate. As I said earlier, he's, he's an action-oriented guy. And so he is not thinking about, I will go practice. He has no time to be trained the way the other soldiers have been trained. Goliath is there waiting for someone to show up, and he has offered himself to go. And so that's why he cannot start... He's taking tools that have not been. So he says, I will play to my strength. I will go back to what I have used in my experience. Again, the mistake we always make. To underestimate the experience of others because it is non-conventional. 
You see, they ask you when they want to maybe to bring you on board in some of this, what's your experience? And the kind of experience they ask you, you start sharing some of your realities, they start saying that is not relevant. We've not seen you work with our competitors, do this, so you don't seem to be the person who brings this. It's for example, if I'm hiring a security man, okay, I have somebody from G4S, goods for stealing, then they show up. Okay? I, and then somebody else just comes on my side and in his CV I said, me, I kill lions. Who should I hire? I will immediately take the, the, the Maasai man. This man he kills lions. This is the security I want. He may not have the experience that comes with I've studied security, I know surveillance, I know security what. Yes, and those are not in any way bad. But what I'm saying here is sometimes the way innovative people do is that they don't underestimate every experience that God allows them to have. David was garnering experience in the obscurity. He was not, he could not come to Saul and say, in the battle of so and so, I was one of the commanders. Remember when you sent us to fight the Ammonites, I was with uh, Abner, and these are the credentials. Abner can vouch for me, he's my reference of why I need to be given the opportunity. He couldn't. Abner himself was not even going to fight. Okay? But Goliath could stand and say, I have fought for the Philistines for the last number of years. I have this experience in battle. I have this number of kills. You know soldiers, they count their, their success with the kills they've made. They say, I have this number of kills. I have, I have defeated these other armies. In fact, there are this number of Israelites who have died in my hands. That's the experience I have. And the Philistines were confident, you are the one to fight for us. You have the experience. David did not have the same. Not in the same nature, but he had an experience that was equally good. It's only that in our eyes it is interpreted as not good because it is not in the same conventional way that the other experience comes. This is a fight between soldiers and you're trying to bring a guy who is a shepherd. But the shepherd is telling you, I am also someone who fights for my flock. And one of the things I can testify here is that a lion has come to try and do something against my work and I have fought and killed it. That's the experience I bring to you. I can't tell you of what in battles, but that's the experience I bring. And we underestimate people because they bring to us an experience that does not fit the narrative, does not fit the story that we are used to. And we say, ah, you don't, you will not take you. Then you lose a very big asset. Because David turned out to be a very big asset. No wonder the king is going to ask, who is this youth? Whose son is he? If, imagine nobody other than his own brothers, nobody else in the army knows. Even the commander is asking, my lord, I don't know this man. He's just appeared today, and all of a sudden he's been asking to fight. That's when he's called and said, tell us who you are. It's when he even introduces himself and says, and his introduction is not long. I am just David, the son of Jesse from Bethlehem. That's me. That's who I am. The experience I have is that my father, being the last one, has given me the job of making sure I take care of his flock. And I've been doing it faithfully, even at the risk of my own life. That is a man with courage. He may not come with the big CVs, but that CV in itself is good enough for him to deliver the results. And he did deliver the results. Lastly, David faces Goliath with this kind of mindset. That this is not just a battle. But this is also an opportunity to glorify God. You see, David keeps reminding all these soldiers that he's interacting with, and even he speaks it to Goliath, the Philistine, that the person you have defied here is not just soul of the army. There is a God that we serve, that you have defied. And as far as I live, you cannot defy my God, and I will sit and not do something. You've actually presented me an opportunity to glorify my God, and I will take the opportunity to glorify God in this particular way. And so that's how David sees this battle. He knows that he will apply his own non-traditional means and techniques, but one of the things that he also brings with him is this assurance of faith that with God who was with me, surely when God saw me killing the lion, it was by his grace that I was doing those things. And even today, he will be with me and he will allow me. The tools may not matter. If I have God and I have trained with these tools, he will use that which is in my hands. And that is the story of how God uses people who take opportunities to glorify him. Moses was never told, go look for some new thing to, to go to, to, to Egypt to bring out my people. The same rod, the same stuff that you have in your hand. I'm not asking you, Moses, to go back and start gathering other equipment. Let us use the rod in your hand. The 
That's how God uses people. And that rod did wonders. He just used to do it like this, part the Red Sea. He does like this, he does a miracle. He does the rod like this. Anytime the rod was released from the hands of Moses, it now became a tool in the hands of God and it delivered what God intended. When that stone left the sling of David, it was no longer just a stone of David. It was a stone in the hands of God who David had prayed and said, give me victory, and it delivered glory to him. And that's what God will do with anything that is in your heart. That which you have in your hand will deliver as miniature, as minute, as unconventional as it looks. It is a powerful weapon when God comes into the equation. And innovators know that. They don't allow that which God has already put in their hands. And when challenges come, they don't count challenges as places to succumb and to give up. They take challenges as opportunities to see God be glorified. And that is the spirit of innovation. So even as we close this morning, this afternoon, please reflect at a personal level and ask yourself, is there a way that I can think outside the box in my work with God, but also in my line of work, in my areas of responsibilities. Because God who created us in his image has given us a spirit of innovation, a spirit to think beyond how things have happened. Yes, the tradition has been this in your line of work, but you can be the one who brings the new initiative. Is there something unique that you can do differently, but can still be effective? Something different. People will even question it. Trust me, the moment you begin a new initiative, people will begin to say, what are you, are you joking? This may not work. But they say, the people who ended up as mighty innovators failed so many times, isn't it? They never allowed failure to deter them. They kept trying, tweaking. Otherwise, we would not have the many inventions we have in the world today. If those people attributed to those inventions took a spirit of defeat, they realized that I can, I have this thing that God has given me. If there's a burden, there's a passion, and he's giving me a different way of thinking about it, let me try it, let me be action-oriented, let me not just give up because I've spoken to two, three guys, and they've discouraged me because they've said it will never work. You know many people give up dreams because of just one statement of the person they first met. You know that happens. You just tell somebody, no, I want to start selling charcoal in this. I've seen that these people in this area actually don't have money, and I want to sell them charcoal. A lot of people have given up on things simply because somebody somewhere who has never even ventured in the same thing. Why does his opinion count? More than the conviction of God that he has given you to pursue that particular thing. Even as a family, can you embrace non-traditional ways to continue enhancing your family? Because sometimes they, they, they say Christian families can confine themselves and, and, and look so, I don't know what the word is. They, they, I mean, they, they, because of tradition that has been put in and in and in, they almost never even have the joy of the Lord among them. Because a little f way of fun is suggested, I, children, to obey we to be creative a bit. And God will actually journey with you. <laughs> and you'll be amazed how when you open yourself to the idea that new things can happen, oh, God is the one who has said to Jeremiah, call on me, I will tell you new things that you have not even known. In other words, he's saying, there's so many things, guys, you do not know. There's a lot of things that we can do together. But you don't call, you don't come, you don't seek that innovation. You have settled for the thing that you found. The way you came in the earth, that is not the way of spiritual people. Even as churches, and this is a challenge to all of us. By the way, maybe I've never said it, I do not have all the ideas. I might have the privilege to lead the church, but I don't have all the ideas. One of you here can be led of God to give us ideas of innovation as a church that can grow us in our mission, that can help us fulfill the purpose of God as a church in reaching lost souls, in, in covering grounds for mission and the gospel. I don't have all the ideas, so please share them. 
always be bold. Even if your idea might look as crazy as what, come and share it. You never hear me say, Shindwe, but I'm let your idea come you. I am not doing that. Please share. I will pray that God gives me ideas, but also pray together that what can we as churches also do? That we are not just always in the posture of being the last one on board because we are so skeptical and hesitant about advancements, new technologies, new things coming. And we don't even sit at the place of innovators. Innovators carry wealth. We've prayed today to cancel the, the spirit of poverty and the spirit of lack. The people that are not lacking now are those that innovated before, isn't it? So may it be you, may it be you that is the next innovator in your line of work in that particular area. It might look like a very simple thing. You bring something and it becomes a solution to a particular segment of society and before long, you have a big market to actually scale up that idea that you've come up with. The God that we serve, church, has made this promise in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 to 21, as we close. Now to him, who is able to exceedingly, abundantly, are, are you listening to those heavy words? Exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we do what? Ask or even think according to the power that is at work where? In us. To him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ to all generations, not just this generation or the past generations. In all generations, this power of God is at work to help people exceed, to help people move to the abundance and to do more than even they have thought previously. Forever and ever. Amen. May that promise, that's a promise of innovation right there in Ephesians. Because God is saying, I make people do things that are exceeding what they thought possible. And the children of God made, created in his own image, have the privilege to be beneficiaries of the spirit of innovation. May you embrace the spirit of innovation and may it work for you and above all, may it work to serve humanity and to serve the cause of God in this generation that he has allowed you to live. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we bless you this day. We thank you. Lord, you say David is a man after your own heart. And I want to believe this morning that part of why you said that David was a man after your own heart is not because he was a spiritually perfect man. He wasn't sinless at all. We have records of his many sins. But I know one thing that you loved about your servant. He was committed to try the things that you've given him to do. He was a man with the spirit of innovation. He was a man who believed that whatsoever tools that you gave him, he could still deliver the results according to the will that you had. May that same spirit, Father, be found in each and every one of us. Because we also know that you have fashioned Christians to be people after your own heart, to be people after your own kind, to carry the same level of thinking, of perceiving things. Just like you were able to look at creation. Look, took the chaos, turned everything around and brought order and allowed us to inhabit this wonderful universe that has been organized by you, Lord. There are many things in the world today that may be in chaos, but we thank you for your grace that we will be the ones to step up and make something out of the chaos. Innovate something out of that which seems not to work. So we bless your name, God Almighty, for that spirit we receive it in the name of Jesus. May this year, as we are saying we are overcomers, we are not those who succumb. Part of our way to overcome the challenges that are there is that we will be counted among those who will innovate solutions to the problems that are endemic to the world and our societies and our communities. Because we are gifted in powerful ways, spiritually, intellectually, by talent, and in many other ways. Allow that the spirit of the living God will bring forth the talents that are deposited in each and every one of us that will be counted as those that in our generation and time, we were not shy 
of covering new ground. We were not shy of introducing new ideas. We were not shy of bringing up new devices that will help to foster your work and the objective that you have for this world. So we bless you, Lord, and we honor you for blessing us with such innovative spirits and anointing. And now we pray that you give us the boldness thereof to be able to implement it even as we know we already possess it. We bless your name and we honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you for that time. Can we rise up? We want to close in a word of benediction. We continue with prayer, please. Continue with the fasting one more week for our prayer and fasting this week. And then uh, we'll conclude by next Sunday. But uh, let's share the words of the grace together. And next Sunday we come and finish the series as we look at time. I hope something has around grit has been developed in you. Praise the Lord. And, and, and do go back to the YouTube and whatever, and you can listen and take points if you aren't able to catch in the course of our sharing. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. The first time visitors, please, Pastor Benson, where is he? He will actually guide you for our hospitality team to host you inside the office. Asante, sir.